Hey guys, it's Medicosis Perfectionalis, where medicine makes perfect sense. Let's continue our playlist called Labs. In previous videos, we talked about the serum anion gap, the serum osmolality. We talked about anti-parietal cell antibodies. We talked about lactate or lactic acid. We talked about lactoferrin and many other lab results, including those for anemia. Today, let's talk about inborn errors of metabolism. One of the ways to diagnose inborn errors of metabolism is amino acids profile. We measure the amino acids, usually in the blood or the urine, and based on what is high, what is low, you can predict what the metabolic abnormality is. So let's get started. Please watch my videos in this playlist in order, as well as my previous video titled protein metabolism and you'll find this in my biochemistry playlist. Here is your diet. It has carbs, it has proteins, it has fat. When a baby is born, the baby is breastfed. For the most part, breast milk has protein, of course, it has some fat, of course. And when I'm lactating, what's the name of the sugar in there? Lactose. One of the most important things that will help you understand metabolism is to ask yourself every time, am I in the insulin world or the glucagon world? Is it the feeding state or the fasting state? Is it the absorptive state or the post-absorptive state? Because they are not the same. In the feeding state, I want to build stuff up. I am anabolic and it's the insulin land. I want to build up proteins from amino acids. I want to build up glycogen from glucose and I want to build up triglycerides from free fatty acids and glycerol. Conversely, when I'm fasting or starving, it's the glucagon world. So I'm trying to break down stuff, proteins into amino acids, glycogen into glucose and triglycerides into free fatty acids. And anytime you burn fat, you get ketone bodies. You'll see ketone bodies in the glucagon world, not in the insulin world. Very important. Let's focus more on proteins. I ate proteins. Let's break them down to get some energy. Proteins become polypeptides and then oligopeptides and then dipeptides and then amino acids, which is literally a monopeptide. How do you break down bonds? By adding water and breaking down the bond. It's called hydrolysis and therefore the enzyme is a hydrolase. All of your digestive enzymes, by the way, are hydrolases. That's why after a big meal, you are thirsty because you used lots of water to digest food and that's why in a restaurant they will serve you water juice tea etc here is metabolism in a nutshell whether you eat proteins carbohydrates or fat the end result is the queen the crossroads acyl-CoA. It's the sun around which all the planets revolve. Take that acyl-CoA into the mitochondria and bring me lots of energy. But why do you call them amino acids? Because they have an amino group and a carboxylic acid group. Amino acid, literally. Why not acid amino? Why does it have to be amino acids? Because this is the order of protein synthesis or translation in your ribosome. You made this part first before this part the N terminus before the C terminus. That's why you have to read them from the left to the right. This amino group will give us ammonia. When we digest proteins, what do we get? Amino acids. We can use some amino acids to actually make glucose, and this is the utility of the carbon skeleton of the amino acids. But what about the amino terminus? It will give me ammonia. Ammonia now is in the blood. Ammonia will go to the liver. Through the urea cycle, the liver will convert ammonia into urea. Now urea will leave the liver and go to the blood. Urea will go from there to the kidney where you urinate it out. Do you want to make it clinically relevant? Yeah. Let's say that I have liver failure. Anything before the liver will go up. So I will suffer from hyperammonemia, which is toxic to my brain. It can cross the blood-brain barrier. Let's say that I have kidney failure now. You know what's going to happen? I get uremia not hyperammonemia. Anytime you block a path, the thing before it will go up. Protein digestion, amino acid, deamination and transamination reactions. You get the amino group and the ammonia, and then ammonia will go to the urea cycle. Urea cycle has an important intermediate that feeds into the TCA cycle, which is awesome. And then when you make the urea, send it to the kidney. Let's say I'm born with deficiency here in this enzyme. Do you think my arginine succinate will become arginine? No. Who's going to accumulate in my body? Arginine succinate or arginine succinic acid. This is called what? Arginine succinic aciduria. By measuring amino acid levels in the lab, you'll find low arginine, 
but high arginine succinate and you'll be able to diagnose this case. Good job! This is the utility of amino acid profiles in diagnosing inborn errors of metabolism. Back to amino acids. The proteogenic amino acids are the ones coded by your genetic code and incorporated into proteins. In humans, these are the famous 20 amino acids that you know and love. But these 20 are not all of the amino acids in nature. These are the lovely 20 proteogenic amino acids. Each one has a name, three letter abbreviation, and one letter abbreviation. Please pause and review. Proteins are made of what? Tons of amino acids bound together by peptide bonds. Do you remember when we talked about hormones before? Some of them are lipid soluble, some of them are water soluble. These water soluble hormones are peptide in nature. Where did you get them from? From amino acids. Many of your neurotransmitters come from amino acids. Your enzymes are proteins. Where did they come from? Amino acids. Even melanin, the skin pigment, where did it come from? It came from amino acids. Moreover, some amino acids can give you glucose in gluconeogenesis. We call them glucogenic amino acids. Others can give you ketone bodies, which can act as a source of energy during fasting or starvation. So these are ketogenic amino acids. And some amino acids can give you both. I can give you glucose if you want. I can give you ketone bodies too. You can classify amino acids, the 20 proteogenic ones, into essential amino acids, semi-essential, and non-essential. What does essential mean? It means that your body cannot synthesize them, therefore it is essential that you eat them in your diet. And these include nine amino acids and they are listed here. Non-essential amino acids, well, your body can make them for you. You do not have to consume them in your diet. They are not essential. And these include these five amino acids. And there are six semi-essential or conditionally essential. What the flip is that? It means that normally they are non-essential. You do not need to consume them in your diet. How However, under certain conditions, like some diseases or some inborn errors of metabolism, they do become essential. Example, in PKU, phenylketonuria, this disease has a deficiency in the enzyme that makes tyrosine. Now, I cannot make tyrosine, so tyrosine becomes essential. Here is the fate of the glucogenic amino acids or gluconeogenic amino acids, they end up at glucose, and here's the fate of the ketogenic amino acids, they end up as ketone bodies, both of which can give me energy, by the way. Gluconeogenesis and ketogenesis both belong to the glucagon world, not the insulin world, because the glucagon world is catabolic, whereas the insulin world is anabolic. What are the functions of amino acids? They can make you proteins, some hormones, the water-soluble ones, not the lipid-soluble ones, enzymes, coenzymes, they can make you neurotransmitters, they can make your nucleic acid, and they can make melanin. When you eat proteins, whose job is to get those proteins or amino acids from your gut to your blood, your intestines? So absorption happens in the gut. How about reabsorption, which prevents the amino acids from falling into the urine? We want to reclaim them back to the blood. Reclaim them is reabsorption. And that's why many inborn errors of metabolism will happen to your gut or to the kidney. And here is another important fact. Normally, you have reactants, enzyme, yielding products, precursors, enzyme, end products. If this enzyme is missing, everything before it will go up and everything after it will go down. Let's talk briefly about phenylketonuria. By the way, I have a separate video on this topic on my channel. Phenylketonuria is a disease where I have too much phenylketones or phenylalanine in the blood. Why? Because the road ahead of phenylalanine is blocked. What's the name of that road? Phenylalanine hydroxylase. If I am missing this enzyme or missing the cofactor, do you think phenylalanine will be able to become tyrosine? No. What's going to happen to phenylalanine in my blood? It will go up. What's going to happen to tyrosine? It will go down and it will become essential. That's why tyrosine is one of the conditionally essential amino acids. This accumulation of phenylalanine is very toxic especially to the brain, which can lead to intellectual disability. Moreover, high phenylalanine can lead to low birth weight, decreased head circumference, lighter skin because you do not get melanin, and these patients have a characteristic musty smell. Phenylketonuria is a deficiency of phenylalanine hydroxylase, which means that phenylalanine will never be able to convert it to tyrosine. If you are a physician, let's measure the level of phenylalanine in the blood and tyrosine in the blood. In case of PKU, you'll find high phenylalanine 
low tyrosine. Let's measure the level of this enzyme. It will be low. Why light skin? Because if you do not have tyrosine, you do not have melanin. It's down the pathway. Early diagnosis can do wonders. Just by restricting phenylalanine and providing the patient with tyrosine, you can prevent and sometimes reverse low IQ. What the what? Yes. Quote from Joseph Sapira. 1. Daily observes patients for whom the history and physical exam could lead one to the correct diagnosis. Hours, days, and even weeks before it can be achieved by those who rely solely on modern technology. Just by listening carefully to the mother describing the musty body odor, the strange behavior, the pale skin, the intellectual disability, etc., you can suspect the diagnosis. Let's review phenylketonuria from Picmonic. You can go to picmonic.com or use the link in the description to access more than 1,400 animated mnemonics like these. And it's not just a picture, it's a video that you can play and listen to. Phenylketonuria is depicted as the phoenix with a ketone key. What's the name of the enzyme deficiency? Phenylalanine hydroxylase. Here's the phoenix, Aladdin hydra phenylalanine hydroxylase, or it could be caused by the decreased cofactor BH4, tetrahydrobiopterin, the tetris hydra. It's an autosomal recessive disease. Here is rhesus chocolate. Tyrosine becomes essential, essential tire. Since phenylalanine accumulates in the blood, we do not give them natural sweeteners because many of them contain phenylalanine. Symptoms include musty body odor, stunted growth, intellectual disability or mental retardation, here is the tarred book, seizures, here is Caesar, and hypopigmentation, here is a hippo with hypopigmented spots, because when there is no tyrosine, you cannot make melanin. We're done reviewing PKU, let's review homocysteinuria. Here is homocysteine. Homocysteine has two paths. It can go this way to become methionine, or it can go this way to become cystathionine. There is an enzyme needed here and an enzyme needed here. If I have deficiency of this enzyme, what do you think is going to happen to homocysteine? It will go up. If I have deficiency in this enzyme, what's going to happen to homocysteine? It will also go up. Very high levels of homocysteine in the blood is very dangerous. It can increase my risk of heart attacks, strokes, atherosclerosis, low IQ, lens subluxation, joint disease. You can measure the homocysteine in the blood. It will be high. Homocysteinemia. And in the urine, it's also high. Homocysteinuria. So I can find a patient with high homocysteine, low methionine. So the deficiency is here. Or high homocysteine, low cystathionine. So the deficiency is here. That's why we need amino acid profiles. What if I have nephrotic syndrome? Nephrotic syndrome is a disease where your kidney is losing tons of protein in the urine and tons of amino acids too. So you'll have decreased level of amino acids. That's not good because you'll be unable to make many proteins. So let's summarize this lecture. Amino acid profiles. Why do we use them? To diagnose many of the amino acid diseases. By the way, there are more than 90 of these amino acid metabolism defects. The average doctor knows about five or seven. That's why you need to get your head out of your sphincter and master your craft. Patients depend on it. Where are you measuring those amino acid levels? In the blood or in the urine? If it's the urine, random 24-hour urine sample is needed. For the blood, we collect few drops from the heel of the newborns usually, put them on filter paper known as the Guthrie card or the Guthrie method, and if you send it to the lab, it's in the red top test tube, which does not contain anticoagulants. That's the where to get the sample from. When to get the sample? First day, right? No. Wait until the baby is fed proteins via breast milk or formula because these amino acids are protein metabolism. You need the pathway to function in order to test it. So wait until the second or the third day of life and then order the test. And in some cases when this is not enough, we do a protein challenge before taking the test. So you feed the patient tons of protein, then go to the lab. How do I measure amino acid levels in the lab? Chromatography. So this is the where, the when, and the how. 
interfering factors. Beware of the diurnal variation of the circadian rhythm. Amino acid levels in the blood are usually the lowest early in the morning and the highest at midday. Infants normally have more amino acids than adults. Pregnancy decreases amino acids because mommy has two persons to feed and because estrogen decreases amino acids. It's one of the reasons that females on average have less muscle mass than males. Another reason is that males have more testosterone, which boosts muscle mass. So estrogen, oral contraceptive pills, decrease amino acids. Other drugs such as steroids, sulfonamides, heparin, and bismuth increase amino acid levels. So you gotta make sure to take a good history before going to the lab. Some examples of these inborn errors of metabolism that affect amino acids. In phenylketonuria, phenylalanine goes up, tyrosine goes down, and becomes essential. In homocysteinemia or homocysteinuria, homocysteine goes up. In maple syrup urine disease, we have accumulation of valine, leucine, and isoleucine. In nephrotic syndrome, you're losing amino acids. Here are the different colored tubes in the lab, and the red top tube has no anticoagulant, which means the blood will clot, serum will separate and float on the top. It's that serum that contains the doozy amino acids that we need to measure by chromatography. If you want to learn about chromatography and electrophoresis, check out my videos in my biochemistry playlist. What does estrogen do to the liver? Gazillion things. Do you want to learn about the normal changes of pregnancy? How about the abnormal changes? How about gestational diabetes? How about hypertension, preeclampsia, eclampsia, acute fatty liver disease of pregnancy, intrahepatic cholestasis? How about twin twin transfusion syndrome? You can learn about all of these by downloading my OBGYN high yields course at medicosisperfectionalist.com. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe, hit the bell, and click on the join button. You can support me here or here. Go to my website to download my courses. Be safe, stay happy, study hard. This is Medicosis Perfectionalist, where medicine makes perfect sense.